So despite the relative youth of this channel, I've been doing work around YouTube for almost a decade now. Between 2015 and 2017, I partnered with the game theorists to create a documentary series called Breakdown. Most of those episodes haven't really found a home since then, either because of their lackluster quality or just not really fitting with anything. But I decided that they would make a good fit for this channel. What you are about to watch is an unreleased episode of Breakdown that unfortunately wasn't able to see the light of day then, but that you can watch now, covering the history of trading card games like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Hearthstone. Keep in mind this was produced in like mid-2016, so it doesn't cover more recent card games like Artifact or Runeterra or Hearthstone expansions past Gadgets in. But the information is still accurate, and I'm incredibly proud of this episode. So, enjoy! It's likely that at some point in your life, you've come across some form of trading card game or collectible card game. These are games comprised of specifically designed playing cards, not dissimilar to the collectible sports-themed cards from the early 20th century or the 52-card decks that have existed since as early as the 9th century in Imperial China. Trading card games infuse ideas from both of these sources, combining collection and specific mechanics into single games. Though rules between titles have varied from game to game, it's typical that a trading card game must have individual and unique cards that are mass-produced so they may be easily purchased by or traded between players. They must also have a rule set that allows for somewhat strategic gameplay, granting players the ability to build any number of unique decks driven by different plans of action. These ideas can evolve into ever-changing metas which are shifted by the introduction of new cards and mechanics through expansions to the games. Successful trading card games can have thousands of unique cards within their vast libraries, with some of the earliest games hitting upwards of 15,000 card variations printed during their runs. Today, hundreds of games line the shelves of physical stores and online shops, and tens of millions of people collect, trade, and battle within them. It's amazing to think how far the medium has come, considering it all began with an idea from a man walking alone in the woods. In the early 1990s, an amateur game designer named Richard Garfield met with Peter Adkinson, founder and then CEO of game publisher Wizards of the Coast, to discuss the publication of games that Garfield designed. Adkinson had to pass on several of the ideas during his first meeting with Garfield, simply because his company did not have the resources to publish them at the time. Regardless, Adkinson liked Garfield and his ideas, encouraging him to continue their development and suggesting that he work further on a game that could be played during the frequent downtime between events at game and comic book conventions. Garfield took this idea and ran with it, incorporating his own concepts with others borrowed from board games like Cosmic Encounters, resulting in an easily portable card game. However, Garfield did not have what he described as his eureka moment until he was hiking with his family in the woods near Multnomah Falls in Oregon. Here he had the realization that not every player had to have the same cards. Instead, they could purchase them, collect them, and build decks and strategies around them. Garfield recalled this moment as overwhelming for him and his game designer sensibilities, his imagination running wild with the possibilities of what could be done with it. And when Garfield returned to Atkinson with the idea, Atkinson saw enormous potential in it and agreed to publish the game through Wizards of the Coast. So, after going through several incarnations and names, including Mana Clash and just simply Magic, Magic the Gathering was first published on August 5th, 1993. When it was first released, Magic the Gathering and the concept of the trading card game absolutely exploded. The title first premiered at Origins Game Fair in Fort Worth, Texas, and the game sold out of its initial run of 2.6 million cards by the end of the month. Wizards of the Coast quickly printed more cards in an attempt to keep up with demand, reaching more than 35 million by the end of 1993. Garfield later remembered that Wizards of the Coast could not physically print cards fast enough to keep up with the insane demand in the mid-90s. At its core, Magic is a fantasy-themed game with a deep lore and storyline that plays out in the flavor text of every card and in other expanded universe material. The mechanics present within Magic also draw heavily from this theming, allowing players to take control of everything from powerful spells and enchantments of all description, to armies of human warriors and dutiful paladins, to zombie hordes and vampire assassins, to mechanical hulks and monstrous colossi, to great beasts of all manner of size and shape. The sheer number of possibilities present within the mechanics and universe of Magic the Gathering is unarguably what grew the game's community of millions of players. 
Each and every one could have a new and different approach to the trillions of configurations of cards, and the nature of its gameplay, the luck of the draw inherent in all card games, means that even new players with humble decks have the potential to defeat masters in their finely crafted war machines, however meager the odds. The popularity of the game and enthusiasm of its fanbase also brought a passion to many players that would lead to professionalism in their play. Large tournaments for Magic were held as early as 1994, but in 1996, Wizards of the Coast stepped in and hosted their own professional tour, the first of what would become an annual event. To date, the Pro Tour has drawn in thousands of entrants and hundreds of players and given out millions of dollars in prize money to the game's most skilled players. The second trading card game was known as Spellfire, created by Dungeons & Dragons publisher TSR. It was first published in 1994. Mere months later, Wizards of the Coast published the third trading card game, another Garfield creation originally known as Jihad and now titled Vampire, The Eternal Struggle. The success of these games led to a boom in trading card games during the 1990s, where others tried to emulate the success of Wizards of the Coast and their flagship franchise. Several companies rushed to have their brands adapted into similar card games, resulting in dozens of games ranging from Legend of the Five Rings to Illuminati, New World Order. Multimedia franchises also got in on the action, resulting in games branded with licenses for Star Wars, Star Trek, Middle Earth, and comic book properties from publishers Marvel, DC, and Image. Even the video game SimCity was given a card game. So many new trading card games popped up throughout the mid-90s and early 2000s that a bubble grew around the genre, and when it inevitably popped, several games were forced out of print. However, this resulted in a market stabilization that allowed for more franchise-based games to spring forth, including, but not limited to, The Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, World of Warcraft, and several other Star Wars titles. The IPs that perhaps saw the most successful transition into trading card games, however, were the adaptations of Pokémon and Yu-Gi-Oh! Both of these games added unique spins onto traditional mechanics introduced with Magic the Gathering, and over the years, both have offered up new ideas to keep their metas alive and constantly shifting. Both games also had the advantage of a built-in audience that carried over from their pre-existing media. On one end of the spectrum, Yu-Gi-Oh! was a successful manga and anime, which centered around characters who actually played an in-universe trading card game known as Duel Monsters. The rule sets present within the fictional game and its real-world adaptation were, more or less, similar enough that both the Yu-Gi-Oh! manga and anime were able to serve as basic teaching tools to the player, which was especially helpful for younger players unfamiliar with other titles. If one were to watch the show, they could very easily buy a starter deck or a series of booster packs for Yu-Gi-Oh! and play against their friends and peers. Likewise, the Pokémon trading card game was just another head on the Hydra that is the Pokémon multimedia juggernaut. This game combined a lot of ideas from Magic with the mechanics from the Pokémon RPGs, including Pokémon Evolution, type advantages, and prizes for defeating enemy Pokémon. Like all other facets of the Pokémon franchise, the trading card game was an enormous success, with many people buying cards simply to collect them for going play of the game entirely. Special cards were even used as incentives to get players to watch Pokémon films. In addition to normal audiences typical of a trading card game, both Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokémon were able to draw in hordes of younger players who were unfamiliar with the genre but familiar with the franchises. They essentially acted as gateway games for millions of children, introducing the ideas of collecting, trading, and battling with cards to people who might see a game like Magic and be too intimidated to give it a chance. Both titles also had insane staying power and remain amongst the most popular trading card games in the world, with millions of cards cards sold every year in tournaments that continue to draw in thousands of players. As the aughts came to a close and the 20-teens began, trends within the gaming industry started shifting towards the digital, and it was only natural that trading card games would shift with it. Though physical card games remain massively popular and probably will remain so for the foreseeable future, this evolution opened up new avenues for designers and developers to explore. Now, that's not to say that digital recreations of card games are anything new. Many existed as early as the 1990s, with one notable example being the Game Boy adaptation of the Pokémon trading card game. Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic were also frequently seen on PCs and home consoles. However, while several were critically acclaimed, most of these games heavily simplified their gameplay and often stripped out the collection, trading, and deck-building aspects entirely. 
Some developers, however, decided to take advantage of their digital platform and the sprawling online network of gamers that sprang up in the latter half of the 2000s. The most notable of these is, without a doubt, Blizzard Entertainment's Hearthstone Heroes of Warcraft, first released on March 11, 2014. Hearthstone was an experiment for the developer, initially created by a small team of between just 12 and 15 people with the purpose of making something different than the massive projects Blizzard usually created. It was decided to pursue development of a new online collectible card game, as many of the team members had enjoyed playing them for decades. They also found it natural to build the title around the company's Warcraft franchise, incorporating existing characters, lore, and gameplay concepts into their game. It also meant that they could pull ideas from the pre-existing World of Warcraft trading card game, first published in 2006. Hearthstone added fresh new mechanics to the trading card game concept, putting players in the roles of heroes from the Warcraft storyline. Each of these heroes also represented a player class present in the first release of the massively multiplayer World of Warcraft, and every one of them has abilities that can directly affect the battlefield. The mage, for example, could deal one damage to any target per turn, while a warlock could deal damage to himself in exchange for drawing an extra card. The development team decided to do away with instant cards that players could cast during their opponent's turn in an attempt to streamline gameplay as much as possible. Mana was also allocated to its own resource and given to the player at the beginning of each of their turns, instead of being tied to specific cards that had to be drawn and played. Several traditional parts of trading card games remained, but were enhanced because of the title's digital nature. Attacks with creatures, for instance, are now animated. Most cards have unique sound bites associated with them, and some even have visual particle effects when they are summoned. All of this only added to the title's personality, which was paramount for the development team. Everything about the title's aesthetics, from its pub theming to its soundtrack composed by Peter McConnell, was designed to make players feel like they were in a relaxing and fun environment. Even the game's name, Hearthstone, was chosen to give players a feeling of gathering next to a hearth and playing a game with friends. Early on, Blizzard elected to drop the trading aspect from Hearthstone. According to Hamilton Chu, the title's executive producer, this was done so players would focus solely on the gameplay and not any sort of marketplace that could dilute the experience. The publisher also chose to make Hearthstone free to play, giving every player a set of standard cards from the outset and allowing them to purchase new cards through digital booster packs. The title is constantly evolving, with new cards being added frequently with expansions and single-player adventures. Its latest expansion, Mean Streets of Gadgetson, was released in December of 2016 and added 132 new cards, with some new mechanics sprinkled in. Though the game began as an experiment for Blizzard, it was undoubtedly successful, so much so that similar titles have popped up since its release. Hearthstone was critically acclaimed for its accessibility, even for people who'd never touched a trading card game. As a result, the title has drawn in more than 50 million active players to date, and though it is primarily a digital experience, Hearthstone has encouraged real-world interactions between its players. Since its release, the title has become a staple in the world of esports, which has drawn in hundreds of skilled players like James Firebat Kostezik, Jeffrey Trump Shi, and Wang Tiddler Celestial Zhu. Hearthstone has even attracted players from other games, including Raynad, a notable player of Magic. Competitions are held frequently, including a Blizzard-backed Hearthstone World Championship, which sees the most talented players from around the world gather at BlizzCon to see who is the most skilled. In 2016, the company increased its prize pool for the Hearthstone World Championship from $250,000 to $1 million, with Russia's Pavel Beltikov taking home the first place prize of a quarter of a million dollars. Outside of the professional scene, Blizzard has also encouraged fireside gatherings, which allows for players to congregate in public areas like coffee shops or bookstores to play against other local players. The idea of the trading card game has come a long way, from a college professor's wild idea while walking in the woods, to multiple physical and digital games that are played regularly by tens of millions of gamers around the world. It's uncommon that a genre can be simultaneously open enough to allow new players to participate without any experience, and deep enough to allow skilled gamers to craft powerful strategies from their components. It's even more rare to have games stick around for decades and continue to innovate on their own mechanics year after year after year. And to this day, all of these titles harken back to what made games so special in the first place, to the idea that has touched so many people and made countless lives brighter, to have fun with friends, new and old. 
Hey, thanks for watching. I loved making these sort of documentary retrospectives, and would love to add them to the rotation of lore, explanation, easter eggs, and cut content videos. If I end up doing that, what sort of documentaries would you like to see? And again, if you enjoyed this, please remember to like the video and subscribe so we may please the algorithm gods. At least that's what it feels like we're doing these days, doesn't it? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.